part of about a dozen or more community connectors who helped us make connections to different groups in town uh, and make sure that they were all involved, which was actually a, a big deal. If you look at the five goals of our project, the first two are centered around community input. Goal number one says to create community consensus around shared visions for Freeport's downtown. And goal number two is to host an inclusive public process with widespread participation. So it was very much a, a team effort. And the reason that we wanted to focus so much on that participation is that if we came up with a plan from the town council, or if we asked principal group to come up with a plan, it wouldn't be the right one. The right one is one that, that you all come up with and we're just facilitating. And that's the idea of the whole project. Um, so it's important to hear from you. We want your input, your ideas, your thoughts, your opinions. Uh, and there are a lot of different ways to get those to us. Uh, our, our task is to build a shared vision, but this isn't something that's gonna happen overnight or even in a year. Uh, it's gonna take a while. And what we wanna know is what direction we should be marching in and what goals we should be setting for ourselves. Uh, what comes out of this project will be fed into our townwide comprehensive planning process, which will start later this year. So as you think about the, the questions and the topics over the weekend, be expansive, think creatively. Don't feel like you need to be limited by what will work in town today or what will work with the current regulations, uh, but, but think outside the box. If this is about painting a vision for downtown. Uh, once we have that, then our job on the council and the town hall will be to focus on implementation and, and create the conditions for the kind of development that we wanna see in town, but we need to know what that vision looks like. So I'll close with a comment that a resident wrote to me earlier this week. Um, somebody who lives practically downtown wrote, uh, as people who live in the area, we see the comings and goings. We understand the traffic patterns and what actually happens in town. We need to be heard and not just listened to. We don't wanna just check the box that said we had public comment. So I couldn't agree more. Uh, and I urge each of you here and at home to share your ideas. Uh, you've got lots of options. There are topic sessions that are going on all weekend. You can participate in those. You can schedule a one-on-one -on -one meeting with anybody uh, on the principal team. There's a link on the website, freeportdowntown.me uh, to schedule one-on-one -on -one meetings. If you wanna come down to town hall, they're hosting an open studio in town hall through Monday. Uh, there are worksheets you can download uh, with questions and a space for, for your ideas. Uh, you can download the workshop and send those the worksheet and send those in. There's a contact form on the website, which is again freeportdowntown.me, or just email your town counselor, anybody uh, on the project team, and let us know, and we'll make sure that uh, the comments get shared with the rest of the team. So thanks again for participating, whether you're here at home, coming over the weekend. Uh, I appreciate the fact that, that you're also engaged. So I will turn it over to Russ, who will hopefully have better luck with the audio than I will. And uh, good evening, everyone. So we've got a, a bunch of people who are here virtually too. So. We're going to be talking to, I'm going to, I need to articulate very well tonight. So um, take my mask off here for this. Uh, thank you everyone to come uh, who came here physically and everyone online. Um, we're really thrilled to do this. This is uh, uh, the last in-person charrette we did was right before COVID. And, um, you know, the type of planning work we do is with communities like you all in person together. And it's really, I think, meaningful to have people in the room and be able to have this sort of charrette in person. I think what your town council and what you as residents and you know, the FEDC has done here is very brave to actually say, we're going to think about our future together. And we're gonna have the really meaningful conversations we need to have as custodians of your downtown right now. And thinking about it in a brave way, because it's future generations that you're really planning and laying the groundwork for. Um, and, and so I think there's lots of hard discussions and conversations we need to have this week while we're here. We're going to be here through Monday night, 
uh, really listening to you and trying to draw and plan as much of this for the future so you can start to have an informed uh, idea of where you wanna go in the future. So what this is gonna start with, and of course the, let me just click on the, there we go. Okay, great. All our technology is working now. So everyone's given a lot of time to this, uh, like Dan said. Um, but I can't thank the residents enough. It's really your brain power that's informing this process. Uh, so please keep keep talking to us. We are listening. Um, you know, we're, we've tried to put out as many channels as possible for you to give us your input and, and for us to really have a conversation. Um, this started, uh, you know, a, a while ago. Really, we've been talking about this for a long time, and I really have to kind of commend the local crew for rolling up their sleeves last summer and trying to get some of this work to happen. Um, we did this, we kind of tricked them into doing this to figure out how much is possible if you put your, you put your arms into it and you start to move things, but then how much needs to be adjusted to make things that are good for people and things that the community is telling us you want easier to do. So, you know, a lot of this was really the success of the people that live in the community and who are working on Freeport. You know, great places are made by people. And I think that was the sort of lesson that we learned through all of the uh, early action projects. Um, and they have to connect with what people actually wanna do in downtown and experience in downtown. So, you know, a lot of folks did, did the town walk with us last winter, but it's those conversations around what happens that connects to the local community that is so critical. And it starts with your values. You know, what are your values for the future? What, you know, when decisions come down the pike later on, what are you gonna to use to kind of filter those decisions and make those choices? And, and a vision has to be informed by how it connects to the community. So you know, we've talked about these before, but we're gonna hit on them again a number of times tonight, as well as, as going forward in the next few days. Uh, the, the one that's sort of central is, is a downtown for all. Kind of, you've, you've decided to bring it back to, to the community, to the people at its core. And I think that's an important piece for all of us to, to continue to discuss. So what makes a great downtown? And, and I think that's something that, you know, we wanna talk about, cause we're starting to talk about solutions uh, for, for some of the visions that you've laid out. Um, so downtown, I mean, it, when you look at Freeport, it's situated geographically in a really interesting location, you know? You're sort of, you know, regionally, you're connected to the sort of large, you know, super metro area of Boston, but you're connected also to Portland and to the other interesting things that are happening in, in the sort of metro Portland area. And then you're connected uh, to the natural, wonderful natural resources right around Freeport. So there's, a, there's this sort of very interesting location that, that you all have to have this uh, context around. The fact that I can get on a train in, uh, in North Station in Boston and get off at a train in Freeport amazes me still, that, that you all have this connectivity to the region. Then you've got this very interesting downtown. You have the bones of a historic downtown and you have the retail presence of a mega super mall. You, know, you have an anchor that brings people by airplane here to shop. And, and it sort of started to, to over the last really 30 to 40 years, things have slowly started to evolve for downtown Freeport. Um, and we've done a lot of analysis we're gonna show you here tonight. We've even, you know, we scanned the sort of core of your downtown with some drone footage to really understand what was going on and how things were relating to each other. Um, and what's important about this image is like, you see in this image, all the parking lots. But what you see in this image is all the trees and all of the connection to the surrounding residential streets. And I think on, when you get on the ground, it's that, it's that sort of you know, puzzle of what happens with this sort of buffer of parking around downtown. And, and how can we start to think about downtown as a neighborhood, another neighborhood within the larger Freeport uh, community? So it, it was a neighborhood at one point. You know, in the sort of height of, of, of downtown sort of um, manufacturing sort of company town mentality, you know, it was around 2,600 people. You know, you're, Freeport is as big as, as it's ever been right now at a population a little over 8,000. But if you look back, a neighborhood 
you know, where all your daily needs can be met within walking distance is about, you need about 2,600 people to do that. Where you have a grocery store, a hardware store, a lot of restaurants and cafes and diner and, and jobs. So when we put this historic Sanborn map on top of Freeport, you can start to see the residential buildings, the sort of mixed use buildings, all these things that made downtown a, a neighborhood historically were there. And, and you know, superimposed on what predominantly now are single story buildings or, or parking lots. And when we look at the history, you can see the sort of you know, quality of these buildings, these sort of mixed use buildings, these sort of general uh, connection to, the, to the, the commerce that had to happen in downtown, to the sort of marketplace that was present here. And then we can see, you know, vehicles slowly start to kind of creep into the photographs. And we have in the United States a, a fascination with, with sort of post-war starting to plan cities and, and communities and the sort of structure of neighborhoods around automobiles rather than around people. And this change you can start to see in Freeport with the diagonal parking, where you know, 1947, the sort of you know, parade ground that was Main Street started to slowly evolve into more and more space for storing vehicles. And, and, and Freeport is not alone in this, in this sort of symptom of the fascination with the automobile. But you know, it started to affect the way we thought about buildings and the way, the way we started to use our land in our neighborhoods. So you can see here in you know, sort of the early 70s, um, you know, we've got the sort of mill building that's there. Um, you know, that's the jobs. You can see some of the residential fabric uh, that, that's now a parking lot. You know, you can start to see the sort of, you know, the degradation of sort of the quality of, 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 the, of the main street. So we start to see all these layers that were built on traditions that are thousands of years old. You know, from 1940s to, you know, to really the, probably the mid 90s, those layers were all peeled away. You know, the layers of sort of the heritage of the place of how we built communities around sort of a more resilient, more sort of holistic way of, of organizing ourselves. Um, you know, those were all peeled away. You know, so what we're trying to do at the most basic level is build a more sustainable downtown. And, and how do we do that? Um, so we look at lots of places have been thinking about this or, around the, uh, the sort of world right now, and it has to do with this quality of a neighborhood. You know, this is Lodo in, in, in Denver, and I show this because 20 years ago, this was all parking, all parking lots and old mill buildings. So it's happening at a scale of city, but how do we actually start to think about sustainability at the scale of, uh, uh, of a small New England village, which is what you've told us you want? So one of the sort of fundamentals we've been thinking about is how do we put people first, and how do we sort of start to think about uh, all the qualities uh, of downtown around people. And, and I think this is sort of the idea of this New England's village center. You know, when you think about a village, you think about bumping into people, you know, going around town and you kind of have a, you have a, a collective under, uh, 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 network of people within a village that know each other and they know each other by name. They maybe bump into each other. So there's this, this sense of gathering and community that you all have an aspiration for, for downtown. Um, you know, neighborhoods, when I say neighborhood, it's an actually a, a real clear defined term in our mind. This idea of a five minute walk from the center of a neighborhood to the edge. The idea that you could, if you, you know, run out of eggs, there's a place you can, you can walk or ride your bike to and get it. There's this sense of place where there's a center with a, with a public space. There are these clearly definable neighborhood qualities and those can be measured. Uh, they can be measured all sorts of ways. You know, people have probably, heard, how many people have heard of walk score? Raise your hand. So walk score is one way of kind of measuring a neighborhood's quality. There's lots of other ones. You know, this is sort of a livable, livable index score where Freeport is at 61. So you're a little above average, but you know, so there's, so there's room for improvement. But when we start to look at all of these scores around how you start to look at the quality of a neighborhood, you know, we can start to peel away what, what it really needs to do. And at its basic level, I think downtown is the heart of, of, of Freeport. It has to be where, you know, everyone comes to celebrate things. Everything comes to, you know, to, to, to talk about significant issues in the town square, the parade downtown. It's sort of the heart. And what I see here, you know, the photo here is about, you know, bringing kids into a park right in, the, in a downtown and, and them feeling like it's their park and they have this sort of spirit and sense of connection and community to it. So when we talk about people, it's, you know, 
it, it, it's not, you know, I don't, it's not for me. It's not for the sort of middle-aged person. It's, it's for kids at, you know, seven-year-olds, six-year-olds, five-year-olds and elders, you know, 65, 70, 75, 80, 85. And wh why do we think about it that way? It's because, you know, though, those are sort of the people that are most impacted by bad decisions, uh, you know, for the lack of a, of a, we call this the bench problem. Um, you know, Older folks will be more apt to walk someplace if they know they can sit down and rest. Younger, younger folks need a place to rest too. Mom, you know, you know, moms or fathers, you know, with kids. So there's these, there's these connections at the end of the sort of demographic spectrum around needs. And, and kids running around, you know, a, a, a sidewalk, it, it, you know, there's this sort of like back and forth between the age groups that need to be fostered. And what we look at the demographics in Freeport, we start to understand that you kind of have this interesting thing happening. You're not a total dumbbell where it's, you know, very old folks and sort of, you know, very young folks. You've got this sort of interesting uh, uh, aging population. And when folks that are aging want to stay in the community and they might not want to drive from sort of the edge of town or out of one of the other residential neighborhoods to come into downtown to do their, their, their go to services or meet with friends, and they want to still stay in the community, where do they go? And I think that's a housing question around as, as your community continues to age, are there options for them to live in a walkable place that downtown? So, you know, we start to look at where the demographics are and, and, and sort of, you know, where, where are they not? And how can we start to use those areas to, to provide some of the, the needs for the types of populations that want to live in Freeport or who are already here and want to remain in Freeport? And you know, this is what I said as the bench problem. You know, and you look at these benches, they're, they're very intimate in front of, uh, of CVS. And uh, you know, the, the, a number of the, the you know, students who, who filled out a survey for us early on in the process talked about CVS as one of their favorite destinations. And we we're sort of like puzzled by that, but it's the corner store, it's the candy counter, it's the soda fountain. It's, it serves this role in the kind of life of downtown that Norman Rockwell painted pictures of. There's sort of this sense of, of tradition that is here represented by this store. So one of our early action projects that didn't get done was really fixing the porch on the corner store, you know, you know providing a spot where people can actually hang out and, and sort of congregate. And it's these little pockets of activity that are about what the people are doing. And the fact that the, the kids are, are hanging out here is, uh, is an important quality. The other thing is a walking problem. And this is something that there's some tension around. Some people have told us, you know, we really like the walkable quality of downtown because everyone in downtown ends up being a pedestrian. You know, you park your car, you get off the train, you get off the bus, but then you're walking. You know, you might be walking a few hundred feet from your parking spot into the store, but you're walking. And, you know, it was one of those things I kind of joked the first time we walked around Freeport uh, uh, with, with Dan and Mary and others, Tawny, um, was the chains in front of uh, in front of free uh, the sort of connection between Main Street and Bow, and, and I thought to myself, I'm like, you know, LL Bean is just you know sort of destination anchor, but you've chained it off from the rest of, of Main Street. Why? Oh, the cars are going too fast. Well, then the cars. Why are you changing your behavior for the cars? Downtown should be a special place that's celebrated by everyone, and everyone in downtown ends up being a pedestrian at some point. So I think this, this walking problem is, needs to be the other way around. How can the cars behave better in downtown rather than the people? And you know, we started to look at this and sort of, you know, part of a downtown is a, needs to be a really robust ecosystem. And we look to nature a lot of the times when we start to think about really complex uh, places like downtowns. And when I look at this map, which is you know, a map we created of just the land uses in downtown, at a very categorical or typological level, it's a lot of commercial. You know, it's, and when I look at that, it's sort of like, wow, that's a fragile ecosystem. You know, you don't really highly functional downtowns. This would be a, like a pointillism painting with lots of different land uses spread all over the place. So when we look at this, we say, well, where are all the residences? Where are all the mixed use buildings? Where are all the other services? You know, how can this land use pattern be more resilient? And then we started looking and say, okay, well, we've heard a lot about parking from you all so far, and we know you've talked about parking for a long time. So I don't want to sort of, you know, rehash that, but I do want to point out 
the, the typological similarity. You know, when we looked at the land use, we started thinking, wow, so what, it reminded us of something. And we sort of said, okay, well, let's look at the parking and let's, you know, we counted the parking, we sort of checked your data on the parking, but then typologically, you know, we look at this, this is a parking donut surrounding a commercial core. It's very similar to the diagram, a diagram of a mall, a regional power center mall. And we thought to ourselves, this is why they want us to come and help uh, facilitate this conversation with the community. Because what we're hearing from all sorts of retail folks and what we're seeing ourselves is that malls are dying all over the country. So typologically, at a very uh, sort of abstract level, downtown Freeport is more similar to a mall than similar to a neighborhood. And the malls are, as we know, are not surviving. So we need to change that. I think at a very fundamental level. Um, so that, that sort of was a puzzle that came out of some of this analysis. So this is another thing, I, you know, you have to measure what matters and you're measuring way too much parking. You know, we've got reams of data about parking, but we have very little or no data about pedestrians, bicyclists, the sort of people that are using downtown. So I think there's this sort of flip that, that we have to have a conversation around is like, you know, if you want to be a New England village, you're not paying attention to the people. You're paying attention to the, the parking cars. So I think it comes back to this idea that we have to start to think about those values we've set for ourselves and what are the tools and the sort of strategic approaches to downtown that we can use to do that. Another one of these is the human scaled idea. You know, you know this word gets thrown around a lot. You know, you can look at Leonardo's you know, Vitruvian man drawing. This has been talked about since you know, pre-Renaissance. But this idea of human scaled is a very important one because it has to do with the fundamental sort of geometry of, our, of us and what we need. So you know, a lot of folks maybe have heard about this, but this idea of the 15 minute city, the 15 minute town, this idea that you should be able to conveniently be able to do, run your life weekly and monthly and throughout the year within 15 minutes. And I think through the pandemic, we've all sort of experienced how important some of, you know, our kind of travel patterns have shrunk and sort of, you know, and we've been making bit more strategic decisions about how we, you know, get around and what we go and do. But this idea of, of how do we start to become more local has become front and center for people through the pandemic. And, and this idea of a 15 minute city uh, is a conversation that's happening at a global scale. And we started to ask, well, because of the transit access, because of the significant retail presence, because of the connections to nature and to other services like groceries and drugstore, you're, you're almost there as a community. You know, you just start, you just haven't started to kind of frame it properly. So, you know, in this diagram, it's the, the, the 15 minute travel is an important one because it, it's spatial. You can ride farther in 15 minutes by bicycle than you can walk in 15 minutes. So a, a 15, you know, a 15 minute walk is about a five minute bike ride, but we can start to talk about how do we make downtown more resilient by connecting it to other things that might not necessarily be within a five minute walk. And, and this, you know, this starts to talk to how, how do we provide more opportunity for business growth and connections to the, the community locally in downtown because they can come from 15 minutes away into downtown. And, and how do we make sure that happens? Rather than choosing to go to South Portland for something, can they choose to come here? And we've heard a lot of, uh, of commentary around, even this afternoon in one of our first focus groups around not wanting to come to downtown in the summer because there's just too many people from away. So that's a struggle. I, I, I can recognize that. But you're lucky, you're more lucky than most downtowns because you actually have a robust tourism industry and you have an incredible anchor destination such as L.L. Bean right downtown. So you have to recognize that those, those are things that are important qualities to build from. And I think the annoyance of not wanting to come downtown is something that we have to work with and, and, and work to support other things that we can do. And this idea of, well, how can we make it convenient for someone to choose to come downtown in Freeport to do, do what they want to do rather than to get in a car and drive 15 minutes to do it. So at the human scale, when we actually look at that on the ground, downtown is really a, is one neighborhood. You know, from the center of Bow and Main Street, it's a five minute walk kind of covers all of downtown. 
and you can see, when I started this conversation, it was about the historic, the good bones of Freeport and the fact that it, it, you know, it has that neighborhood structure. And there's a variety of neighborhoods that support it that are right around downtown. So when we saw this diagram, we sort of said to ourselves, how can we better connect all of these neighborhoods to downtown? You know, because they used to be, they, you know, people used to walk into the mill and, and kind of walk into the market. You know, th those are there. The other thing is, you know, some, you know, lots of colleagues of ours around the country are, are looking at how to improve parks and how to improve the sort of the, the squares that are in neighborhoods. And, and they always talk about this idea that uh, our, our, our towns are fractal, you know, uh, you know, there, there's 10 things to do in the region. You know, you can go to the, 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 the river, you can go to the coastline, you can go for a hike. There's got to be 10 things to do in, in a destination like downtown. And there's got to be 10 things to do in the main square in downtown. This idea that us as humans, you know, have lots of, of needs and activities, but if we can start to have this sort of relationship, what's called the power of 10, then, you know, there's more, there's more resiliency in the system. You create greater places. So in downtown, what are the 10 things you can do in downtown? And I would imagine each of us have different ideas for what those could be. And this is important because human scale has to pull a lot of things together. You know, this is a, a, a photo of a street that had been oriented towards the automobile. You know, and this is sort of the mid fifties. This community decided that was not aligned with their values anymore. You know, so fast forward almost 60 years, this is what that same street looks like. You know, I'll do it again. You know, you see the bus stop, you see the small sidewalks, you know, they can, you know, they're too, too afraid to ride their bike in the street. You know, now it, it, it's entirely oriented towards the human scale. You know, and this is now one of the best main streets in the world for walking, for shopping, for public life. And they made a strategic decision around not orienting their community to the scale of the car or the vehicle, but to the scale of the human being. So this brings it back to, to another concept we need to think about is how do we become local? You know, how does downtown represent that in, in a large way? And you've told us this, you know, there's lots of things already happening. You know, and, and I think this is where I, I'm gonna come down on you all a little bit, but you really are in a better position than most communities. You have robust community partners. You have lots of activities already going on. I'm challenging you to do even better than you're doing right now. And I think that is uh, a, you know, an aspiration you all have. You know, you've told us that. You know, there's sort of these, these challenges that you recognize. We wouldn't be here doing this if you didn't recognize there were big challenges. You know, and I think the biggest one overall is you know, the sort of the empty storefronts. Uh, you know, everyone recognizing that, that the sort of whether it's the Amazon effect or whether it's the people valuing their, their time and, and how they spend their money differently. Um, but the, things are dynamically changing right now in, in the whole retail storefront spectrum. And you know, there's some tactics, there's some things that you could do. You know, this is one, I, this is in Portland. It's a very inexpensive, you know, in the scale of cost of buildings, this was an inexpensive endeavor. And it's very small. So it's of a price point that small local businesses that know there's a market can start in. And I think that's the, the thing. Local, local people can recognize, oh, I have a market. Uh, there's a market here, I know there is. I just need a space that I can try it. And, and these serve that space. And I've heard a number of stories of sort of scaled buildings like this that they started it and they had it and they moved into a bigger storefront. You know, and they kind of, you know, there, there, there's one down in the Cape Cod that I know of that started in a size like this, then they went to a 2,000 square foot space. Now they're in a 5,000 square foot space. It's the idea, if you want local, you have to give them an opportunity to start because they are at a disadvantage from the national retailers because they're not capitalized and they don't know if their market's really there. They're not, you know, they're, and I think that's the experimentation idea of local that you have to embrace. So vacancy is getting better. I think that's a message that you all have to talk about together is that Freeport has exceptional opportunity and has, a, and has an underlying quality that most downtowns don't have. But you do have some vacancy, that, that's true. It, you see it because the storefronts are empty, but we mapped it to sort of say, well, where is it happening proportionally the most? And I think each of these properties we could talk about in more detail over the course of, of design week, 
you know, there's some very specific qualities or conditions at each of these that I think could be improved to help with the retailing of it. But I think there's also a larger macro sort of economic trends going on around retail, which the pandemic has accelerated. So, you know, FEDC has been tracking this. You know, I think you can kind of see the spike there that, that um, you know, that the pandemic set off, but it has been um, slowly declining. So, so vacancies are still an issue, but, you know, realistically, there's always, you know, four to 7% vacancy in a, in a downtown and kind of a retail environment, you know, office might be 10% sometimes, um, you know, if you're at 5% or 6% vacancy, it, it's a very, very hot market before 5%. It, it, it's, it, there's other problems that happen. So I think, you know, that's just something to keep in mind that vacancy is the thing you see on the sidewalk. Um, you know, but there's under it's a symptom of other things that are going on. So how do you sort of help to correct that? So, you know, we talked a little bit about some of these earlier today in the first uh, kickoff kind of focus group, but you've got to recruit local passionate business owners. They're, you know, they are so focused on getting their business going, whether it's online or developing their product, that they, they have to be recruited. Someone has to actually go out and, and, and talk to their friends and talk to so-and-sos and acquaintances and find them and then convince them to come to downtown. You know, so, you know, I told the story about the, you know, a record store. Like someone opened a new record store in a community I saw recently. And, and it was going like gangbusters. I said, well, how did you, how did you know there was actually going to be a market for records? You know, and he had figured that out. You know, the, he sold the great, the best needles for your hi-fi system turntable. He had the new vinyl. He had everything going on, but it was because of his passion towards that particular swath of the market that he knew there would be a customers for him. So I think it's like, how do you recruit those people? You have to kind of find them and bring them into Freeport, and you've started to do that already. You know, and I think this was another early action project that I commend you for. You know, they're out there. You know, Maine is a tremendous network of these people, whether they're makers, craftspeople, product people, they're out there and they can, you know, they can start to see Freeport as a place where they can get a foothold into a storefront and be able to sell their stuff and grow their businesses. Uh, the second piece of this puzzle that you've told us a lot about is local food, having more options around food. You know, there are some great um, restaurants already in, in Freeport, you know, but yeah, if you if you don't get in there before nine, you're, you might be out of luck. There's sort of this idea of like, how can you actually build a restaurant scene? You know, how can you start to actually create a buzz around the food opportunities in Freeport? And this doesn't necessarily just need to be a, you know, a, a, a white tablecloth meal. This could be a fruit food truck or it could be a pop up tent uh, festival. It happens a couple of times a month. It's just the idea that People who enjoy food and particularly local food and the kind of food system that Maine has, uh, you know, Freeport can be a platform for, for providing those passionate people the opportunity to bring and do their, 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 their high quality food here. And you know, we tested this a little bit. We sort of started to experiment with this, had a lot of conversations with a few of the restaurateurs in town already. And it's this idea that it has to be a symbiotic relationship between them. And, and why do I say that? Restaurant tours in the restaurant industry, you know, a chef might have an old sous chef that he knows wants to come and open his own spot, or a restaurant tour might have a buddy or, a, you know, that has been talking about a new concept. There's this idea that they, you have to, you know, support that ecosystem and have a symbiotic relationship between all the food things happening in town, whether it's the push cart or it's the five-star restaurant, they all have to work together. And then the, going back to that idea of collaboration, you know, not just with the restaurant tours or the food industry, but downtown has all, you know, downtown's, you know, prehistoric, you know, it's been going on, you know, since, you know, pre-agriculture. It's the idea that collaboration happens at the market. People bump into each other in downtown. It's this idea that there's a societal conversation going on. And, and downtown has to sort of serve that purpose. And, and I think we've all experienced, you know, the folks are online right now, that, that there are some things that the virtual office place can't do. There's some things that us as humans need to connect around. Downtown is the platform for that. You know, there's the coffee shops, the co-working spaces, the, someone brought up earlier today, a, a incubator, you know, where I can come and I can, 
have a desk. I can find business coaching. I can get business service. I can support the, the, the growth of my endeavor in downtown. And people can bump into each other in downtown and all of a sudden have uh, new projects and be collaborating. And then this is sort of part of a kind of strategy called economic garden. You know, the old idea, you know, old idea was go out and be elephant hunting. We're gonna go find that big 200 person corporate firm they're gonna move in or this, you know, you know big anchor retailer they're gonna move in. That, that strategy still works in places, but more often than not, we see greater benefit from gardening, going around and trying to seed a lot of things, helping those companies grow, sort of supporting them with, with, with human infrastructure, with people that can actually uh, help them. And you have some of those you know, really intelligent business owners in Freeport already. That could be a great support network to start to build up a better, uh, a more resilient and larger network of these businesses. And then, so thinking about not just retail, but all of the sort of things that happen in downtown, it, it, we're seeing it really become an experiential uh, requirement that it's not just about going in, in, and buying a t-shirt. It's about going for an experience and then deciding, oh, I'm going to get a t-shirt while I'm there as well. It's this sort of thing about people valuing their time and valuing the kind of experiences they're having more. So, you know, in this sketch, it's not that you need to go out and build an opera hall, but it's the idea that you have that experience of music in town. It could just be in a really great uh, storefront or, you know, that there's these things that can build around the, uh, uh, the interaction between people that are more meaningful than just making sure that the, the storefronts are filled with, 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 tenant, with retail paying tenants that are selling something. And you know, we're seeing this a lot, you know, uh, that people are kind of doing this placemaking uh, as a way, as a, as a very effective economic development strategy. You know, and this is the stroll uh, in East Greenwich uh, on their main street. And then, you know, going back to this idea of a resilient sort of ecosystem, that if you had more than one anchor downtown, that might be helpful. You know, this idea that, you know, the meeting house effort, I'm so thrilled to see how that goes, because that could be your second anchor, I think. You know, the idea that it actually, you have this fabulous suite of things happening in that building. It's situated on the other end of Main Street, effectively. But what other anchors could you have downtown? You know, and some, an idea came up a few months ago about, well, is there, is there another brewery that's downtown? Is there something else that connects to some of the other things that are bringing people into downtown or into Freeport already? So thinking a little bit more about uh, the sort of cultural side of this, um, you know, it's the idea that uh, you have these great resources, you know, just the connection to the water. And how can we start to think about the, the qualities and the, the heritage around that and, and, the, and the bringing that culture into downtown and sort of supporting each other. And this gets to the idea that, that uh, the markets that create that, whether it's arts markets, food markets, all of that sort of can, can enhance the culture of downtown. And then that goes to the arts too. You know, I don't think street art is right for Freeport, you know, this is street art. This is sort of the graffiti that you see. This is in Lynn. You know, it's been sort of a award-winning sort of effort to use art as a way to, to cultivate a, a neighborhood in their downtown. But there's probably an art uh, uh, that fits with the culture of downtown Freeport. And, and, and how can that support, and not just be here at this one venue, but be sort of a foundational element of all of downtown. I think you have that, you know, you have a bit of that already happening. You know, how can you have a music scene, support a music scene in downtown or a theater scene? You know, downtowns are those places that on the spectrum of opportunity for, for art and culture to be supported, downtowns is where they organize. You know, that's why you have great ballets in great cities of the world. How can Freeport have the, the scaled appropriate cultural venues and, and, and happenings that it needs to, to be in a downtown? All right, so a couple other things around how do we get there? You know, we've been thinking a lot about this and we're just starting to, th to draw ideas and sort of think about uh, how you can move this forward. The first big bucket of those is around the sort of open spaces, the sort of parks and thoroughfares. Um, and, you know, it has to do a lot with how we get around. 
And, and how we get around is not just you know driving from a, point A to point B on a, on, a, on a country road. How we get around is also, you know, I can go to the down the, the park downtown and spend an hour just strolling around it with my son. You know, how how can you know how do you get around is a is a fundamental quality of, of a downtown. Um, and thinking about the network of spaces is interesting. You can kind of see here the sort of mapping of the different qualities and different characteristics of spaces. And you have, you know, uh, some of you might tell us, oh, I don't spend any time in, those, in, that, in that woodland or that public space. That, and some of you might say, I spend all my time in that. But it's this idea that there needs to be a connection, a constellation of different types of spaces. And you have to have thoroughfares, streets, roads, paths, sidewalks, trails, connecting these things together. So you, so you have this sort of overall spatial experience. Um, and, and the big one is, is what, what we've sort of affectionately been calling the, the main and bow problem. You have this main street and you have this bow street that, you know, high, you know, when you look at downtowns, they always have that sort of situation where there was a main street or a high street that was sort of the, you know, the, the, the highest energy sort of thoroughfare. And then you had the market street where the, other interesting things were happening and the sort of messiness of, of sort of downtown might have been. And then you have all the other blocks and side streets and all. But so when we look at Main Street, and we've talked about this a bit already, and you know, I know people are, are, are concerned about DOT and what do we do about the state DOT and how can that, that I think will work its, all, its way out. Like the DOT is starting to have very interesting conversations about how to help places like Freeport and think about their streets differently now too. That's an opportunity for Freeport to take advantage of. So how can this street be more for like it belongs in Freeport and less like it's part of the regional highway system? And I think that's, you've told, the way you've been talking to us, it's this idea that this street is scary to cross. It, this street is, you know, it's congested and bumper to bumper traffic in the summer. It's, uh, you know, it, travel speeds are, you know, like on a day like this, you know, people are going too fast. It's, there's all sorts of interesting things that this street could do to better support your long-term vision. Uh, you know, and it's sort of interesting when we kind of look at, you know, rate the quality of these spaces. The question is, how can we get all, you know, how can we get all of these up to five? How can we really increase the quality of all of the experiences on these streets? You know, or, you know, where you've told us sort of in other surveys that you think downtown is walkable, but then we really asked you about it, ease of walking, 2.2 out of five, you know, five being the best, you know, so you're, you're below, you think you're below average. Um, so some of the quotes here, you know, it's sort of interesting to start to, you know, you all know this, you, you kind of, you know, collectively, because we've been hearing from so many of you, you know, these issues, you know, you know that downtown is, has the potential for walkability, but isn't that walkable in the key spots, you know? so. People have solved this issue before. Okay, so this is this is a street in a downtown, you know, that got totally butchered by their DOT. You know, they just ran a highway straight through their downtown. This is that same street today. You know, that community said, "Enough. We're, we're gonna we're gonna make Main Street for our neighborhood, our downtown, and our our community." You know, so they did a robust planning process and, and, a, and an urban design process, and that's it on the left. That's a Main Street. And that's another main street on the right. Which one do you think you, you know, they enjoy more now? You know, what's happened in that place is this transformation has not just been about the physical environment, it has actually brought the community closer together because they have this fabulous outdoor room to spend time in together now. So it's this idea that that, that infrastructure change, which is timely and costs lots of money, actually leads to a stronger overall community. It's investing in the overall community. This is not just happening in the US. This is happening all over the world. Right? This is a small village center. You know, that's their main street there on the left. This gets a lot of truck traffic through this intersection. You know, it's sort of a main sort of you know, uh, shipping, uh, shipping route. That's, that, that's the intersection today. They decided to actually get rid of all of the traffic signals, get rid of all of the signage, slow all the cars down, all the trucks going through there. And they created what was called a shared intersection. It's a plaza where cars and vehicles and trucks and pedestrians and bicyclists all uh, can kind of dance together. And it's been incredibly successful. So successful, they decided to apply the same treatment to their main street. 
They took out all the curbs. They took out all the crosswalks. They took out all of the stop signs and they made their main street into a large plaza that invites someone in a wheelchair to cross almost anywhere. The cars are moving so slow that it's that safe. Um, so I wanted to tell, just show you this for a second. And I apologize uh, online if you could hear it and not hear me. Um, what is a, a real human scaled street about? And this is sort of the dance that you can see of, of what happens in a downtown when you get your streets right, where everyone is on equal footing. And you can just sort of see the dancing uh, of activity in a very, very happening place. And it has to do at a, a really fundamental level about the quality of the street. What's the curb look like? You know, how fast are the cars going? You know, look at the kid just run out. You know, in the US, you'd be terrified. You know, and, and the, what's that thing doing? It's just, it's this idea that the public life of downtowns ha, has to be, the infrastructure has to be informed on the, about how the life is lived, about what has to happen there. And when you get it right, wonderful things can occur. You know, you get this sort of dance of the city, the dance of the neighborhood, the dance of the community. You know, and, and so it's just sort of this idea that we don't, we're just starting to understand this in, in, in this part of the world. And I think Freeport has this opportunity uh, to be able to do, kind of be a leader in that. So part of the other idea of downtown is not just fix Main Street and Bow Street, but the side streets. And you might say, well, what do you mean side streets? You have side streets. They just are all parking lots right now. You know, it's this idea that you have, a, you have these side streets that uh, supported downtown, you know, the main street, you know, and you kind of have this hierarchy of streets in downtown. And this is the reason largely, I think, because you don't have enough side streets that no one wants to drive through downtown because there's so much traffic. There's no shortcuts. You as locals should have shortcuts to get through downtown, but you don't have those right now. Um, that, you know, that's a symptom of a larger issue that you don't have a network of streets. You know, you kind of have the cow path problem in New England where all the roads kind of came in together, but you never built the grid out as you grew. You sort of, you know, so you still have this sort of bottleneck. Um, you know, so this is the, the, the Oglethorpe plan for Savannah. And I, I, I well, why, why are we referencing Georgia and Maine? But the, Savannah's block size is very small. You know, it's a very, very tight grid. I think it's like 200 feet by 200 feet. And they have these lovely parks sort of sprinkled throughout. So this is the original plan. This is a more recent plan that they've kind of expanded. And you can see they kind of lost their way for a while. You know, this is the original Oglethorpe plan, real tight grid, lots of parks. And then this is the expansion where they sort of forgot about the good qualities of a street network. You know, but the idea is that these small blocks are based on these fundamental principles around really good productive places that support people. And one of those is that there's a network of things that are happening. You know, so you can, you know, if there's a traffic jam there, I can, well, I can go to the side street and then I can kind of cruise over that way. And, and then it's the same thing for walking. You know, great downtowns have a sort of variety to them. You're not just going to walk that same route the whole time. Well, I'm going to take this street today or I'm going to go around this way. There's a sense of discovery. And when you kind of look at the street network, you can see that sort of that pattern is kind of all coming into town. But what hasn't happened is the network of sort of small blocks that sort of support the public life hasn't really been clearly defined. Or when it was clearly defined, it's degraded over time. And we can see that, you know, this, this drawing, which is maybe we can talk you through a little bit more, but this is sort of all the streets are in black here. That's your main street you can see. And you can see like just diagrammatically, there's no shortcuts, you know, but here we started to say, well, how do you create some shortcuts? You know, is that really a shortcut there to kind of value pass downtown? I don't know. You know, could there be another shortcut? There might be some power infrastructure, you know, it might be some topography, we don't know. But it's the idea of how do you knit together these shortcuts in this finer grain block grid uh, that, that happens in good side streets? So then there's this other idea of how do you, you know, heading downtown. You know, we call it downtown. You know, everyone would go down there to do stuff. They would, you know, go check things out downtown. They would, you know, the, let's go to the market. Oh, it's down in town. Let's go down there, downtown. You know, downtown Freeport, you know, had, had trolley service at one point. It was such a, you know, there was sort of this connection 
regionally to going to other places. Well, I'm going downtown Freeport. Well, how do you get there? So people are, you know, people need to be able to get here. And you and when the, when they're here, they need to be able to get another to other places. So these have sort of underlying principles as well. You know, that you have to have choices. You know, you have the breeze, there's things you can do to kind of to, to move around the region. You know, I talked about the Amtrak train already, but this idea that a good network, you know, good side streets and, and, and how you connect to the larger world has to have lots of variety. And I think in a place like Freeport, it's not necessarily that, that, it, that you have, when we say good service, and we've been thinking a lot about this, it's that you can, it's predictable. It's convenient, meaning if that trolley, if that, if that bus is gonna show up at 915, well, if it shows up at 9.45, my whole day is screwed up because I've planned around that 9.15 arrival. It's this idea of convenience. So if we want to have sort of Freeport be really high functioning and connect to the larger region, how can we make the transportation sort of connections more predictable and therefore more convenient and induce more people to use them? You know, so if you look at it, that, that's a 10 minute walk to your train station. You know, so I don't, no one should drive from Boston to Freeport. You know, it's just, there should, so, but what happens when you arrive here by train and then you wanna go for a hike? You know, how does that connection happen? You know, how can you start to solve this, you know, coming to downtown and then going to do something and coming back downtown, but not using a vehicle perhaps, or if you're using a vehicle, there's other options. So there's this connection of, net, of things that are going on. You know, this is the same sort of the, the bus system. You know, you've got two stops downtown, it covers most of downtown. You know, but how, you know, how do you start to build out this network even more? And this is the idea of what's called a kind of mobility network. The idea that everything kind of comes together. And what you're seeing here is the sort of beginning, the bike lane markings, this idea that you, you're, you're thinking about bicycles, but they're not totally networked up yet. You know, so I think in the future, this map would be very different because you'd have a sort of networking of all sorts of overlapping mobility modes. And then I think there's a sort of fast, last bit here about, about uh, the public spaces of, of downtown. And it's this idea that you actually, downtown has to have these arms that reach out to the scenic qualities of Freeport and these sort of destinations. And you know, this idea of you know, how do you get to the water? If you're in downtown, how do you feel like you have this connection to the, to, to the river and to the larger sort of you know, regional scenic uh, qualities around town. And, you know, you've done a lot of studies on this previously around, how, you know, trail system connections, at, sort of more active living, you know, how do we sort of do that? So we've kind of mapped all those connections here. Now it's sort of, our job is sort of saying, well, you know, if the East Coast Greenway does come through downtown, how does Main Street react to that fact? You know, how does, you know, how do you know that you're actually on the East Coast Green, Greenway? Besides, you have a little, you know, tin sign on, on the sidewalk. Does that inform the quality of that street, the character of that street, what that, that street looks like? I think it should, because you have these wonderful natural features around downtown. Shouldn't downtown actually be on that same list of wonderful places and, and have the quality of, of, of the sort of scenic nature of the region? And it's this idea that downtown needs to be scenic as well. It's not just it's not just going to see the leaves and traveling around the countryside. It's that people come to downtowns because they're scenic as well. You need a picture like this somewhere in downtown. You go online and Burlington, Vermont has got thousands of these same photos, you know. But it's the idea that downtown needs to be part of the scenic route as well. And I think, you know, you have there's some great ideas bubbling around how to do this. But I think it's the idea we build from those good bones. And this is the idea, this goes back to one of those fundamental principles of how we get around and how we make good, good choices around transportation that the natural features need to be connected into the transportation network as well. Okay, so we've talked about public life, sort of how people interact together. We've talked about the sort of public spaces that they have. Now, how do you actually put that all together? You know, and this is where buildings have, in, 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 the, in the life of a downtown, buildings actually have to be the set dressing. They have to be just the sort of container that all of that happens in. You know, it's, it, it, it's sort of, you know, they have to support that at a most basic level. If they undermine the public life and the sort of the spaces you're trying to create with your streets or your parks or your squares, 
then the overall ecosystem you're trying to build for your downtown is undermined by one building or by a, a, a bad choice around a storefront design. So these, the sort of architectural features and the kind of qualities of the sort of block, you know, the, the, the sidewalk, the street frontage, they need to service the, 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 the larger downtown. So the first thing we wanted to just share with you is this idea of quality frontage. And when I mean frontage, it's this, this idea that that's a storefront, you know, so it's on the, you know, there's these, the, the frontage along the block of, of, of your main street or your or Bow Street. There's a quality to that. And it, great downtowns have really high quality building frontage. People understand how they need to behave on those streets and how behaving a, a good building can include increase the frontage quality, which therefore people have a more enjoyable time walking on that street, which means that more people want to locate their businesses on that street. It's just sort of like this, this sort of naturally self-supporting system that happens in great downtowns. You know, the one on the left is horrible frontage. It has nothing to do with the human being. You know, now this was a flavor of building that was very successful in certain places, but I don't think this is characteristic of the high quality frontage you want to have in downtown Freeport. You know, and then this one, you sort of say, we sort of say, well, why are you saying this is not great frontage? Okay, so on Main Street, it's not. You know, the windows are too small for retailing. If you're, if you're walking by too quickly, you might not even know that, that that's a coffee shop. The outdoor seat, I mentioned this earlier today, even it's sort of like, you know, how many times we've seen folks just sitting on perched right here, worried about falling into traffic, but they wanna, you know, have a conversation, you know, over coffee. It's this idea that this as a coffee shop needs to have better quality frontage for the sort of purpose it's serving in the larger life of downtown. It's a beautiful building though, you know, but it's just this idea of the frontage is, is, is off a little. So we mapped all of that. And we'd like your input on this because you know, it's, uh, there's, there's some art and there's some science here, but it's the idea that how can most of the frontage in downtown be good, you know, be green, you know, and therefore your downtown, more people will enjoy themselves downtown because the frontage quality is supporting that overall vibe of being downtown. Okay, so what else happens on the frontage? Parking, you know, parking is an element of frontage. And sometimes it's, and I won't want to talk about it from a perspective of sort of two things, the teasing someone to convince themselves to get in their car, to come downtown, I'm just going to run down there and get that. And I know I can get that spot right on the sidewalk, that, that, you know, that 15 minute spot that's there. It's always empty. I can get that. So they decide to come downtown and, and park and they, they, oh, it's, it's full. Well, I'll just go in the lot and I'll go, you know, I'll go to the, do what I was going to do anyways. But you don't have a lot of that teaser parking. You don't have a lot of street parking at all. The other part of that is, you know, so the, the car is a sign of buffer on certain streets from what's happening between vehicles traveling through and, and what's happening in, in the life of, of a downtown. So, you know, we just sort of wanted to map this to understand well, why is there not a lot of, why is it, we have this question for you. Why is there not a lot of street parking? Lots, most downtowns have a lot of street parking. So then we sort of said, okay, well, what happens if someone, you know, if you start to see people building on the public parking lots, how do you, how do you still manage the parking downtown? We said, well, well, how much parking can go on the streets? You know, so we sort of said, well, from sort of the center of downtown, this sort of Bow Market intersection, it's sort of hundred percent corner. And well, if you wanted to walk out five minutes, you know, how many parking spaces could you get on all the streets? If the street was wide enough and could kind of be redesigned a little bit to take that. So, you know, I think this adds up to, you know, somewhere between 500 and 700 parking spaces that could be accommodated downtown just on the curb, just along the frontage of the curb. And this suggests a conversation we need to have is what should that frontage be used for? Is it for storing cars or should it be used for wider sidewalks or should it be used for landscaping, more trees, more, more, more greenery downtown? Should it be used for bicycle facilities? You have that much extra space on your streets downtown to store 700 cars. Do you want to do that? Or is there another way to use that space? So getting into architecture, you know, sort of, you know, what, what do these buildings look like? And, and, and we use the word vernacular. It's sort of the idea that in Freeport, 
they should look and feel like they're in Freeport. And I think that's this idea that there's a vernacular to it. You know, there's a, there's a dialect around the buildings that need to be built. And you already have buildings that you paid a lot of attention to to make sure they have a quality. Your McDonald's being the one that I talk to other people about a lot. But it's this idea that there's this architectural uh, characteristic and quality that you wanna have. And you have some of those already. You have a lot of great buildings. So, you, you know, we don't have to go far to point to the, well, what's the vernacular for Freeport? I'm not sure this is it either. I'm going to pick on this building a lot over the week, but you know, it, and, the, and the idea that, well, if people are going to start to think about new buildings more because you're positioned in the region and, and this larger sort of you know, New England area, the, the access to nature, the quality connection to jobs, the options around rail, the you know, outdoor lifestyle, you're perfectly positioned for people who want to live here. You just got to build them the buildings and the apartments and the townhouses for them to live here. Or, you know, I don't want to move out of my community, but I don't want to take care of my big yard anymore. So how do we keep the people that have been in Freeport and living here a place to live when they're, when they're changing habits around their life uh, occur? And I think that's the idea of, you know, how do we deliver housing? You've told us a lot, like, why don't we have more people living in downtown? And how do we have more housing in downtown? You have to be careful about what kind of housing. I do not think you want the housing on the right here. You know, this is the sort of, you know, if you've been to Ikea or bought something from Ikea, it comes in this flat pack sort of box where you have to put it together. That's flat pack, put it together your architecture. You know, it comes out of boxes and it's panels and you put it together and it doesn't, it could be anywhere. Or do you want architecture that has a character and a quality that might be of a smaller scale and be more particularly oriented toward the vernacular of Freeport? And I think, you know, these are just some examples of different size buildings, but it's also connected to parking. And this is where housing and, and, and building buildings and transportation collide. If you don't have the transportation and the sort of mobility uh, network properly designed and functioning, including parking as part of that, you're managing the parking, then you start to get architecture that's, that, that is out of scale and out of character with what it should be because you're trying to hide parking behind building. And some places are more successful at it than others. Um, you know, this is actually a five-story parking garage behind a three-story mixed-use building, you know, and that's on their main street. You know, this is a, a, a fabulous pedestrian street right in their downtown that, that's their shopping destination. But they, the reality is you have to have parking because it's part of your transportation system. So how do you make sure it behaves well? Um, and we don't know if that's the right solution yet, but we want to talk about it with you because it's connected to that. It's connected to housing. It's connected to how you do development in a way and in, in a form that you're going to be happy with and the future generations are gonna be happy with. So we just started to look at some of these public parking lots and sort of saying, what kind of buildings could be built there? You know, this is sort of, you know, a, a large apartment building. You know, it sort of has a scale to it that is what we're seeing built a lot in the region. You know, it has elevators, has parking behind it, maybe in a, in a, in a, uh, in a deck or in a garage. But it's a scale that has to have a certain dimension to it. A certain, the geometry has to work a certain way. There are other ways of doing housing though. You know, this is one of them. This is sort of a more medium scale where you're, you're, you might, the building on the left might be big enough to have an elevator, but it might only have stairs. The building on the right could be a three or four unit kind of triple decker, sort of, you know, a very vernacular thing we see throughout New England. But that's a different scale. And, and that might not be a scale that the, that the market will deliver on its own. You know, that's not, that's something that we're seeing communities recognize that, this is out of scale for certain places. How do we actually move the market to deliver these kind of, these kind of buildings? And this is called sort of the missing middle. You know, these sort of middle scale buildings are missing from a lot of communities. They're not there. Or there's this smaller increment. There's a much smaller scale. This idea that you're building in what, you know, so we used to call rods, this idea that, you know, you can only find a tree big enough to span a certain size building. So you get these 16, 18, 24, 28 foot, townhouses, then it was really about the size of lumber that could support the floors. And the idea that that increment 
that connection to the building material started to inform how downtowns were built out. So is that, or is that this kind of scale that you want to see throughout downtown? So I'm going to stop there because, you know, that was a lot to take in, but at the most basic level, downtown has to be about people, you know, it has to be about people watching people, people talking to people, people buying things from people, people, you know, having dinner with people, people thinking about new products to sell at their store. It's this idea that it is a collection of humans that are coming down to town to talk about the future. And I think you have to be uh, open to that idea that, that downtown is that platform to support your community. So thank you. What we're gonna do now, and we're gonna do this online and in the real world. So there's bound to be problems. So I think everyone, everyone ha hang in there, we'll get through this. All right, we have a lot of material up on the back on physical boards, and we have all that same material virtually on the, on the, on the white, virtual whiteboard. Michael and Carlos are going to be, Michael, Michael's in the back raising his hand. If ever, no one online can see that though, but he's gonna be manning the virtual board. And we're gonna have a few people there to talk with them. And then we're also gonna have a few real world people at the boards to talk about that. What we want your input on is there's four stations. The first station is the values. You know, the circles that we showed in the beginning, we really want your big ideas around those values. Are there things I didn't talk about tonight that you want to see? Let us know. So write on a sticky note, you know, I really want a dog park, you know, and put that on, on, on the value. I really want that. You know, we want your big ideas around those. So that's a, a station number one. Station number two is the thoroughfares and the public spaces. You know, wh what do we do with some of these streets? You have this land downtown. How do we make it more productive? And it could still be to store cars. I, do, I want your input on that though. What are, and we started to have some ideas and thoughts around what could that land be used for? So that's, that's station number two. Station number three is this sense of scale that we just talked about, the character of the buildings. Is it large, medium, or small? You know, and how do we do that? Because if you could give us a sense of your preferences around that, that's gonna start to inform what may or may not be possible. And then, uh, and then the fourth station, what is the fourth station? Ah, it's looking at the sort of building, the actual building. And I had a really fascinating conversation earlier with one of your community members around, well, if we have an aging population and they need medical assistance, they need to have an elevator so we can take them down carefully. And if that's important to you, then the buildings have to be of a certain scale to afford elevators. So that's going to inform, okay, well, how do we, you know, how, if you're comfortable with a certain scale of building, how do we then overlay all these other conditions on it that need to happen? So there's sort of a, a station, you know, a, a collection of ideas there where we want your input on there. So those are the four sort of stations that we want you to move around the board and move around the room and give us input on. And we'll have people there that you can ask questions and talk about. So thank you, everyone. We're really excited to, to kind of spend the next week with you. So uh, uh, let's get to it.